October, we mark Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It means there's no better time to talk about what we can do to protect ourselves as we become increasingly reliant on the cyberspace to carry out our everyday tasks and obligations. There are constantly new threats, developments or challenges to be aware of, and the topic can feel overwhelming for some. I'm here with Will Wright, Santander International's Chief Operating Officer. He's going to talk a little bit more about what we can do to protect ourselves when navigating the rapidly evolving digital and cyber world. Well, thank you for joining me today, though it would be great to hear a little bit more about you and your responsibilities and your role. Hi. Um, Yes, so I guess very simply my role is to operationally run the business, but more specifically, and I guess for today's conversation, everything to do with technology and operations falls under me. So importantly, cybersecurity and fraud, which are are very closely linked, uh, very much under my remit and something I spend a lot of time thinking about. So a good place to start in terms of the topic we're talking about today is a high level overview. So how would you define personal cybersecurity and why is this something that we need to be aware of? So I think it's really important to highlight the personal side because I think a lot of the time people think about businesses protecting themselves from cybersecurity, but really want to focus today on, on, on individuals and it's really about protecting your personal information, your devices, your you know the digital devices you use, and and your identity online. And I guess as we are all of us more and more digitally online all the time and sharing more information, that becomes more of a risk. And it's it's getting people to understand that personal risk they're taking. So I assume in personal risk, it's linked to financials. So it'd be I'd be interested to know what the financial impact of fraud is. What are the numbers and the statistics that you've seen? Yeah, people talk about cybercrime as, um, you know, crime that takes place on the internet. But as I said before, it's really tightly tied with with scams and fraud. So Santander UK partnered up with the Social Market Foundation to produce a report on on what they termed the fraudemic. And they looked at the period between 2021 and 2023. And in that period, there were 10 million Britons impacted by by fraud. Uh, A lot of that driven by cybercrime. It cost the economy 16 billion average loss to a to an individual was around a thousand pounds and maybe more importantly the emotional impact of of being a sub you know subject to cybercrime or fraud is really is really significant and so the, the number of data breaches the number of uh, events that are happening are only increasing year on year as there's more and more data out there so it's really important that everyone understands that risk back to the first point yeah Exactly. Yep. And a lot of us are probably exposed to that in our jobs, kind of being aware of scams, maybe in the financial services sector, probably more so. Like you say, it's important to consider the personal impact that cybercrime can have. I wanted to talk about the specifics of cybercrime and where it kind of comes from. And one thing I saw was about the dark web. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it and how it links to cybercrime and fraud. So I don't know how many people know know much about the dark web. It sounds very intriguing, of course, but really it's just an illegal marketplace for drugs, weapons, counterfeit goods. But very importantly, it's, uh, it's where most data is sold online. So data that's been stolen in breaches, it will be offered sometimes for just a few dollars on the dark web to anyone that, that, wants, to, that wants to buy it and then use it for uh, nefarious means. It's not an area that most people are aware of, but now it's becoming more and more easy to check if you if your data is on the dark web. There's uh, the credit reference agencies like Experian offer tools to to look for look for it there, and there's free tools. I think even Google offers um, a way to look up your identity on the dark web and let you know if there's passwords stored there or or any any of the rest of your data. Yeah. So there's free tools out there for people to check. And unfortunately, it seems like this is something that happens to all of us. We get the emails saying, you've had a password leak. Um, So it is definitely worth people checking uh, where their data is and kind of getting control on that, I imagine, because identity theft is very real. And it kind of sounds like an obscure concept. So would you like to talk about what that looks like for the average person? In the end, unfortunately, it's it's really common. And people might think by the term identity theft that it's targeted that someone is trying to steal Meg your identity but it, it's much more widespread than that it's you know a combination of using data breaches that are out there and social engineering which we'll probably talk a bit about to just persuade people to give away 
too much information and allow criminals to act as that individual, which is what identity theft is. But they are doing it at huge scale. So it's not targeted. It's not targeted at businesses. You know, every, so get back to the individual, we all need to be aware that we may well be caught up in a data set that is then used where people are trying to take people's identities to, um, whether it's creating passports, whether it's trying to get access to your accounts. It's, um, there are many routes for criminals to benefit from your having access to your identity. Yeah, and I think we all underestimate that, which is important to note as well. We've covered already how easy it is for your data to leak, you to be vulnerable to attacks like this. So I'd be interested to know in how customers and banks like Santander International can work together to prevent this as much as they can. Look, we, we're doing a lot. It's, it's something I'm, you know, we're talking about internally on a weekly, uh, monthly basis. I think one, one of the things we're very keen to do, one of the reasons I'm here today, is to try and educate the general public, our customers, because we've got to work together. We can, we can, we can, and do put lots and lots of controls in place to try and protect our customers from cybercrime, um, from frauds and scam. But if customers are unaware of the risk, if they don't understand it, then it makes it very, very difficult. There's actually a very good program on on BBC on iPlayer uh, called Scam Interceptors, which I'd encourage anyone to watch one or two episodes of because it just brings it to life how easy this is for the uh, fraudsters to use your data against you and how convincing they can be, whether it's over email, over the phone. um, There's there's lots of sort of live uh, scams taking place, which they're they're able to intercept, including the title. And it's really insightful. And I think it would just help people understand that that risk and probably make them less likely to fall fall for the scams. Yeah, I think... You always feel like it's never going to happen to you, don't you? So it's really something important to hit hammer home about it can happen to you. It's very easy for it to happen to you. So you should always work with your bank, be generally careful so you can prevent where you can. Because unfortunately, it seems a bit inevitable that our data is going to leak. We're going to have a scam attempt. So it's really important, as you say, to, to have some personal responsibility and make sure you use the services that your providers provide to protect yourself. Talking about the more specific things that we can protect ourselves from, the general things to be on the lookout to prevent us getting scammed, having money taken from us. What are the common threats that we should all be aware of that are easy for us to keep an eye on? The most common one is is what's termed phishing, and that's receiving an email where someone is trying to get you to click on a link, uh, give up some information. 35% of malware is delivered via email now, and I think something like 94% of organisations have had some kind of event that's been triggered by someone acting on an email that was a, a phishing email. So something that is trained out a lot in business, probably not trained out enough in the, in the public realm so it's really important for people to understand what phishing is and to really consider if an email they've received is genuine there are variants of this smishing is where it gets delivered via a text message or or whatsapp uh, and they're very very common now as well and vishing which is which is voice and you know this is where uh, someone's calling you up either trying to extract data or you know may lead on to a, a scam or a fraud and I heard a stat the other day, a half of landline calls that are now made, and not a lot of us don't use landlines anymore, a half of them are fraudulent calls. Wow. And it's great that they all have catchy names to remember these <laughs> Yeah, they're catchy. I'm not, I'm not sure to talk to what they are, really. But, um, but yes, I mean, email, SMS or text and, uh, or voice, you know, any of those channels that you use, um, they, they may come in, come in via one of them. And, of course, social media is another area where... Both we need to consider the risk of putting our data out there, because if we have a big online footprint through social media, it puts your, puts your data out there, it creates a risk. And of course, you know, people will try and contact you through social media. There's lots of scams through the likes of Facebook, which are very, very prevalent nowadays and, and very successful, unfortunately. It's definitely rampant. I mean, you go in your junk folder and it is quite the site <laughs> of attempted scams. It goes beyond people reaching out to you directly, doesn't it? You can download things or click on yeah. things. that. So talk to me a bit more about what those terms are specifically. I mean, phishing is, is just one route by which you might get malware or ransomware. And again, technical terms, but malware is just um, software that if you install it on your computer, it's going to do something you don't want it to do extract some data, take control of the machine. Uh, Ransomware is a very specific version of malware where it will take complete control of your machine, lock it down, 
and then you're likely to get a um, a request for payment to either give you access back into your machine or they may threaten to release some of your data. They may claim to have access to embarrassing emails. It, it could be all sorts. And that's a personal thing, but it's also an area where it can be a real risk to small businesses to suddenly lose access to their capability to do stuff um, online. Very much something to be aware of. I mentioned social engineering earlier. People need to understand what that looks and feels like. It's someone trying to gain your trust by the knowledge they've found out online. Yeah, and that social engineering is using stuff you may have shared on social media or is, or is out there through data breaches to demonstrate to you that they know enough about you that they can pretend to be from a company you trust, for example, your bank. People need to be aware that just because people know information about them, it doesn't mean they are who they say they are. Don't be pressured on a call uh, via email. Also, don't be fooled by the too-good-to-be-true offer. Have a think about how you're being contacted, and uh, as always, calling someone back if it's a phone call is the right way to go on a verified number. Yeah, the CEO attack is normally normally quite a common one where your CEO is emailing you something very un- ominous and you jump into actions thinking, oh, I must do what they say in this email. I've seen a few examples of that personally. So they do get clever with it, the social engineering aspect of it. I know there's probably more old school attempts to get into people's details. So what could a password attack look like? Yeah, so I mean, the password attacks are pretty simple. And if, if people have basic passwords, then good one to remember is long and strong the longer the password the the harder it is for a computer to crack and with you know the super powerful computers that are out there now unfortunately a password only protection only offers you protection for so long but if you've got 16 characters it's actually still quite a long time so it's a it's a good starting point and there's lots of stuff you can do around passwords and and things linked to passwords that we can advise on as well I think it's important to note as well, you think that someone trying to get into your account via your password is an actual person doing that, but it's not. It's a machine that has more capabilities than we do as humans. (laughs) It's an important one to be aware of. So it all sounds very scary, intimidating, ominous, um, all the ways that you can get scammed and get attacked. Um, So I think it's really important to cover the tips and advice that we can give people um, to protect their personal information online. So I would love to hear what you think are the best ways to do that first up increase your knowledge around around the risks hopefully people listening to this are keen to increase their knowledge there's loads of information out there national cyber center has a great website with loads and loads of advice on it so even if you can just spend an hour a year on updating your your knowledge of it that will protect you significantly and so yeah the things more specifically to be wary of which again would be covered on some of these websites be wary of phishing, you know, it's the most common way you're likely to be subject to cybercrime. Don't fall for that sense of urgency. Don't fall for the too good to be true offer. And also don't fall for the there's a risk to you that's that's right now. I mean it's back to the urgency thing again, but it'll quite often be the uh, the strategy, say in the banking world, that you get a call that pretends to be from your bank that will say, if you don't act now and give me this code, you're gonna lose this money. And so don't, do not be pressured into doing anything, into d- divulging information that probably if you took time to think about it, you, you know you shouldn't. And those emails, if you weren't expecting them, delete them. You know, yeah. if, you can't, if there's no way to verify them on a, on a number you can check by calling them back, just delete them. And social engineering, again, it's the same thing. They're trying to put themselves in a position of authority. It's very easy to break that spell Find a number from who they say they're coming from. If it's your bank, the number's on the back of your card. Say you're going to call them back and call the verified number. If they pressure you to stay on the call, that is a massive red flag. You already know that you have caught them out. Passwords, you know, strong, unique passwords. Some people say, you know, long ones, pick three random words, uh, things you can picture, makes it easier to remember. If you have lots of passwords, password managers can be a really good way to to store that information, keep it secure. Still, you know, d- don't share them across sites. It lets you having a password safe can help you generate you know really strong passwords and unique ones every time. But as we said before, passwords are sort of relatively weak by themselves, and multi-factor authentication is probably the most important tip. You know, think about where your data is and whether it's protected by multi-factor authentication. Now. Multi-factor authentication is basically a password plus other factors, and that's typically, so the password is something you know, um, that's factor one. 
then it's something you have. In, a, in banking senses, this could be a one-time password that's sent to you on your device so that the device is something you have. And ideally, you get a third factor, which they talk about something you are, and that's where biometrics come in, so face IDs, um, fingerprints. So combination of all those three is great. Um, um, and it amazes me personally that people don't think about where they're, where they're using MFA. So banks enforce it. If you don't have multi-factor authentication on your email account... That is a massive risk because think about how many passwords can be changed by the I forgot my password, email comes through, you verify it, you've changed the password. So if you're not protecting your email account, that is a, a huge gap in your in your personal security. You need to know when you're on a website if it's secure, there's a there should be a padlock in the URL bar, the bar at the top. We should all think about making sure that software we use is kept up to date, you know, simply with our iPhones, Android devices, making sure we're taking the security updates, installing virus scanning software on your on your home PC, all good things to do. And you know, these are all layers of protection. If you if you do them all, if you keep them up to date, it really, really helps. Generally, just be really cautious with your personal data. It's the most powerful bit of information that a fraudster can get hold of to then follow through with other cybercrime, with frauds, with scams. So when you're sharing your personal data, always ask yourself when you're filling in a form for someone, why do they need this data? And if you're not comfortable sharing it, you shouldn't have to. Fantastic. They're all really helpful tips. And like you say, kind of combining all of them together, um, you've got the magic combination there. These criminals and these fraudsters are clever. So it's important to know that it can happen to you getting scanned and getting hacked when that does happen what should people do what should be their first port of call and then what should follow if you've if you've just got a slight concern if you want to check something out one of one of the really important things which i probably should have covered in top tips is is ask someone you know ask a friend that you trust what they think about it i mean if you if you know you've been hacked then you need to clearly act quickly let's assume it an, an account that's been hacked you need to contact the people you hold that account with on a on a verified number. So again, if it's your bank, the number on the back of the card. If you're in a workplace scenario and you think you've been hacked, tell your boss. You'll have a, a cybersecurity representative in the business that may just be your boss if you're a small business, but you need to make sure that people are aware. So do not try and hide it. In a, in a personal setting, you know, find someone to come and speak to. Again, for our local customers, we're more than happy if someone's got concerns to, to walk in the door of the work cafe and, and speak to our staff. Again, if they know they've been hacked, call, call our number, act, act as quickly as you can. You know, there are things that we will never do that I should just reiterate again now. We'll, our staff won't call you and ask for security information. We won't call you and pressure you to stay on the phone. We'll be more than happy for you to call you back. We won't ask you to move money to another account to protect it. We will never ask you for one-time passwords. That's really good to know what people can expect during that process. And again, I think you raise an important point about not hiding it, not feeling embarrassed. It could be a lapse in judgment, forgetting to, you know, put that two-factor authentication on your email and it's that easy for it to happen. So I think there's some great tips that the bank that you're calling will not be annoyed at you or offended if you're like, I don't believe you. <laughs> absolutely. We, we want to be we want to be challenged. It's absolutely fine. And and, you know, and the police are there to help as well. If, yeah. you, if you're subject to ransomware, you know you've been hacked, there are specialists within the police who will know how to help you. So again, don't feel that you're wasting police time. Call the police. There are numbers on the police website. I think people can underestimate the impact that it can have. So yeah, making people aware that there is help out there in multiple different channels. So talking about Santander International, what are you doing to, to fight against fraud and crime? It seems like quite a untamable beast. Um, <laughs> so I'd be interested to know how you guys keep up with the changing environment and the pledge that you want to make to customers. It's constantly evolving. I hope it's not untamable, but it's, it's a constant battle um, and and the, the attempts are, are definitely on the increase. Santander International are a small part of a much bigger group. So across the group, we spend millions on cybercrime and protecting our customers against scams and frauds. As part of a global group, we know we understand UK trends. We understand global trends. As I mentioned the report that we, we partnered with earlier. So we're, we're very much trying to make sure we understand the risk and we're trying to communicate as best we can to our customers so we do lots of stuff on social media but people have to take personal responsibility in making sure they stay educated it, it can seem like a, a world of uh, technical information to understand again if you're not comfortable with digital things speak to a friend that is don't be embarrassed to ask for advice 
and and you know don't be surprised if for example we may slow down payments now we are looking at a lot of payments that go through the bank to try and protect customers from it so that can be a frustration but hopefully our customers understand we're doing it to try and protect them also i mean i think you said it at the start but People should not feel they're immune to this. You know, some people think, oh, only vulnerable people fall, fall foul of this. But again, watch that scam interceptors program. Absolutely normal people like you and me are at risk and need to be on our guard. Well, some great advice there. Um, Will Wright, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, some really, really helpful perspective and tips and guidance. Thank you very much. No problem. <laughs>